Thomas Jefferson, the third president of the United States, went and got himself a Bible, a King James Version Bible. And he took some scissors and he carefully went about meticulously cutting out parts of the Bible and then pasting them into his own book to create his own New Testament. His New Testament was all about Jesus, but without any of his mystical works, none of his miracles, none of, didn't mention the resurrection or the ascension. It didn't mention miracles like turning water into wine or walking on water. His purpose was to create a Bible that was based on Jesus as a man of morals, a teacher whose teaching was true without any of the miracles, without the spiritualness of God, without anything that connected Jesus to being divine. Instead, he created a 46-page document of doctrine. My younger sister, Jen, when she was a teenager, also got a new Bible. And uh, instead of what most of us do, where we grab our highlighters, whatever your favorite color is, mine is green, and uh, you start highlighting your favorite passages to make them stand out on the page, she decided that she had a better idea. And so instead of grabbing the highlighter, she grabbed the black marker pen. And she thought the best way to highlight the verses that she liked was to eradicate the verses she didn't. And so she went about marking over all the Bible verses that she didn't like, that she didn't understand, that she was confused by, and that allowed the verses that she really liked to stand out on the page. Obviously, we quickly had some words with her and got her a new Bible. <laughs> but you're probably thinking, what was she thinking? What was she doing? How could, how could Jefferson do something so horrendous to something so sacred? But I think you'll find if we spent some time actually looking at the verses that we look at, if we did a poll of how many of us in the room know what John 3.16 says compared to how many of us know what Numbers 4.28 says, I think you'll find that subconsciously, myself and you are probably guilty of the same thing. We're guilty of cutting out sections that we don't like, turning it into a book that we like, turning Jesus into a person that we can always agree with. After all, isn't that what highlighters were made for? To create the Jesus that we want? Tim Keller says, if your God never disagrees with you, then you might just be worshiping an idealized version of yourself. So this month, over the next four weeks, we're gonna be tackling some hot topics like Johnny's already mentioned. And you don't wanna miss a week. Can I encourage you to try and be here, watch online, whatever it is, to catch these four weeks. It's going to be real. You may hear stuff that you may have never, ever heard said in church. We're going to talk about relationships. And relationships are currently being defined by culture, not by God. And I believe that God is going to give us wisdom and revelation over the next four weeks so that we can become the example of what relationships should look like in the world. And so that's my prayer for this, this series, is that that's what we become. I'm excited for that. And so as Johnny said, we're going to talk about sex, we're going to talk about dating, we're going to talk about singleness, and we're going to talk about marriage. And today's topic is sex. Woo. So we're going to look at sex. We're not going to look at sex, we're going to tackle sex, because this, this is not, not a practical session. Uh, and this is a topic that can make many of us feel uncomfortable, can make us cringe, make us feel embarrassed, and sadly within the church has caused many to feel guilt or shame. So I've got a few points to my introduction before we actually get into the message. And the first one is this. This message is for those of us that follow Jesus. For those of us that have decided to spend our days becoming more and more like him. Who are trying to become all that God has called us to be. And in that case, we're choosing to sacrifice ourselves. Therefore, if you're in this room because you walked in off the street, or your friend dragged you along, or you're watching online and you're not a Christian, don't switch off. Don't leave the room. There is still stuff that you can learn in this message. But I want to remind you that this message is for those who say they follow Jesus. Secondly, I want to introduce why I'm talking on this topic today. I didn't just draw the short straw. Not that I'm sure there is a massively long straw in this series. I can't figure out which one would be the long straw. Um, but it's because I have a university degree in theology, and a master's in pastoral theology, where I completed my dissertation called A Pastoral Approach to Pornography. Or in our house, we called it 
porn again Christian. Um, for some reason, my Christian university didn't think that was an okay title, and so I had to change it to a more appropriate one. Um, but throughout writing this dissertation, I spent countless hours studying what the Bible said about pornography, and more widely what it said about sex. I studied the church's response to the issue, and I, at the end, made my own suggestions of how the church could tackle these issues. At the same time as doing this dissertation, back when myself and Johnny were in Liverpool, I co-founded a project called Get Real. And this was a youth work project that uh, had the aim of teaching sex education well in schools and youth groups. I don't know about you, but my school sex education was pretty rubbish. And so we had this passion of going in and equipping young people with the right information so that they could make well-informed choices about not only their relationships, but their sex lives. And so I've also spent countless hours standing in front of teenagers, parents, youth workers, talking about these issues. And so I don't tend to necessarily get very embarrassed around this topic. I've talked about all sorts with 30 teenage boys and a Thursday at 8 o'clock in the morning or whatever time it was. And if you've done marriage prep with us, you'll also know that that's true. I I'm, I'm, I'm don't hold anything back when it comes to marriage prep. Um, I'm passionate about the church being a place that we can learn about these issues and not be a place where we just hear the word no. See, I grew up as a Christian in a Christian home. My parents are incredible. I love them, and you're going to get to meet them soon because they're moving down. And um, uh, I had the brilliant upbringing in the church, but the problem was I heard that sex outside of marriage was wrong. And I've come to learn that as a, t as a teenager, when you hear that in the church, you tend to go down one of two routes. The first route is the route I went down, which is I became avidly a purity, you know, preacher. I uh, got myself the purity ring at probably about 12. I wore it every single day. I would preach to everyone that sex is wrong. You can't have sex outside of marriage. It's bad. And subconsciously, I taught myself that it was bad. Sex itself was bad. It was gross. It was dirty. It was wrong. It was sinful. It was evil. And in some ways, I also had taught myself that sex had been created by the enemy, created by the devil. So then when you, if you're like me, if you come to getting married, you then have this really difficult switch of, hang on, I'm now married and sex is meant to be okay, maybe even good, but it's not, it's dirty, it's evil, how can this be? And you have to re really struggle with this transition because that's what you've taught yourself to believe. The alternative is that you come down this route and you go, well, church said it's wrong they're not really sure why, no one's really told me about it, I've not learned, so maybe it's just something from like the Old Testament that we don't have to follow anymore, and therefore, oh, I'm just going to go for it. And then you come to your marriage, and you, you feel a sense of guilt or shame because you haven't actually made it to your wedding pure. You may have messed up. And so either way, I believe we've done exactly what Thomas Jefferson did. Either way, whatever route we've taken... We've gone and said, well, I'm going to pick and choose the Bible that I want. I'm going to pick and choose the Jesus that I want to follow. And so we're talking about this topic because it's a topic that the church should talk about. Sex is being defined by culture, and yet sex is much more than what society tells us it is. We're not talking about it to shame anyone. That is not the purpose of this message. In fact, I pray, my prayer is that this message will actually bring healing and breakthrough for some. And I'm also praying that it would bring conviction. Let me be clear, conviction, not condemnation. The best way I can think to explain the two of those is that condemnation points the finger at you. Tells you that you're wrong, you're sinful, you are unloved, you are a failure, and it's all about you. Conviction points the finger at the action. It says, although you're loved, and although you're uh, made in God's image and he loves you, the thing that you are doing is sinful. And so my prayer is that God would convict people, not take people into a place of condemnation. So before I finish this introduction, which is going on longer than I'm sure we all hoped, uh, <laughs> I want to remind everyone here in this room and those watching online that you are loved that God loves you, and no matter what you've done, haven't done, seen, haven't seen, thought, or haven't thought, God loves you. And so I want to take a moment for everyone to copy me and say a sentence, and this sentence is, shame is not from God, I am loved. So let's all say that together. Shame is not from God, I am loved. 
okay? And so if at any point during this message you feel that shame creeping in, I want you to speak to yourself and say, shame is not from God, I am love. That feeling is not from God, that's the enemy whispering to you. That is not from him. He wants you to know today that you are loved. And he may convict you today, but he's not going to condemn you. So that's the introduction done. And I came to a realization this week that I sadly cannot address every single question that we have about sex because we would be here probably until next Sunday. And uh, I've already probably going to go on longer than we would normally have a, a message, but probably only about like five or ten minutes, hopefully. And we'll see how we get on. Um, <laughs> And so it's impossible, it's been really hard to like narrow it down. And so if you do have questions at the end, I am so open to talking about things with you. I'm so open to answering your questions or praying that God would answer them for you. Because I don't have all the answers, that's not who I am. I'm not God, but he does. And so if you have questions at the end, please do come and speak to me. Come and speak to Johnny, speak to someone, a friend of yours, who can pray with you that God would give you the answers that you need. Um, but today I've got three points, three main points. And so first, we're just going to pray because I think we all need to pray right in this moment. So Father God, we just thank you that you are giving us this opportunity to speak about this topic, God. And I pray for every heart in this room today. I pray that you would protect their heart from feeling any shame or guilt, God. I pray that you would bring healing, you would bring breakthrough, and you would bring your conviction where it's needed, God. And we just pray your presence would fill this place, God, that we would tangibly experience you this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. Point number one. Sex is good. Sex is good. It's made by God for within the context of marriage. As humans, we were created by God, and he made each one of us intricately and designed on purpose each part of our bodies and each part of who we are. He firstly made us relational. He himself is a relational God, existing as a trinity, three in one. Relationship between the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And if he's a relational God, then we, as made in his image, are relational beings. He made us to desire relationships, relationships with him, relationships with friends, romantic relationships. And we have that desire within us to be fully known, to be fully seen, to be fully accepted and to be fully loved. Relationships call us out of ourselves, out of isolation and into communion with others. And for our relationships to reflect the Trinity, then our relationships need to be reciprocal, equal, open, intimate and grounded in vulnerability. The problem we've encountered within the church is that tradition taught us that desire aroused the impure parts of our bodies. And that's why traditional thought tells us that sex was only made for procreation. The purpose of sex was solely in order to procreate. And this is where many people have therefore got the idea that sex is wrong or it's uh, bad or it's dirty because it's not about pleasure. But if God is God, if he's who we believe him to be, if he's holy and pure, then how on earth can he create something impure? And yet he created sex. So sex isn't impure, it is in fact good. And he created us with a desire for sex, and he made it pleasurable and enjoyable. The book of Song of Song or Song of Solomon actually is kind of an erotic poem, right? It's a celebration of sex. It's an extraordinary expression of mutual desire. God didn't create sex just for procreation. He created it for pleasure, for connection, and procreation. Science and our understanding of our bodies have really allowed us to realize that even more. All you have to think of, do is think about the anatomy or our hormones to see how God designed sex for pleasure. A lady called Thatcher, not Margaret Thatcher, another Thatcher, uh, in her book, Liberating Sex, wrote this. Women's bodies are made by God in such a way that the capacities for orgasm and reproduction are different and the organs needed for each are separate. Therefore, pleasure must have been part of the design. And alongside our anatomy, we also have the chemicals in our bodies that get released during orgasm. Yes, I have now said that word twice in church. You're welcome. 
During sex, many chemicals are released into the brain, such as dopamine, which is the pleasure hormone, testosterone, norepinephrine, oxytocin, which is the, the chemical that wipes out stress from our bodies, vasopressin, endogenous opiates that drives our euphoric response, and serotonin, which is that feel-good, happy hormone that we all love. These chemicals cause a bonding. They cause us to feel euphoria. They cause us to feel relief and relaxation. And therefore, what happens is as those chemicals are released and we experience those feelings, our brain makes a connection between the feelings and the chemicals, and therefore the chemicals and the action. This has all been designed by God. Sex was designed by God. God knew also that sex had power. It has the power to join two people together emotionally, physically, and spiritually. Physically, as two bodies come together. Emotionally, because those hormones that are released cause an incredible bonding between the two people. And spiritually, because it is a covenantal act. And we'll get onto that in a minute. And so God knew that it was powerful. And therefore, he created a container for it in order for it to not cause chaos, but to bring life. And that container is marriage. Mike Todd shares a great analogy for this. He said that water is powerful. And when water is contained and comes through our taps and is contained within the pipes, it is life bringing, it's enjoyable, it's satisfying. However, when water is breaking through the pipes and bursting into the house, in no longer contained, it doesn't bring life, it causes chaos and destruction. And even when those pipes have been fixed, it leaves a residue in the house. Sex is the same. God created a container for sex, and when it's contained within the context of marriage, its power is life-giving, it's enjoyable, it's satisfying. It's the glue that keeps a married couple together. But when we allow sex, we take sex out of the container, it can cause chaos and destruction and leave a residue, not just in our lives, but the lives of those around us. Why? Because sex is a covenantal act. You see, in the Old Testament biblical times, when a couple got married, they had sex. That was it. That was what sealed the deal. That confirmed that the couple were now married. In Genesis 2, 24, it says, That is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife, and they become one flesh. And Mark 10, 6-9 references the, this verse and adds, So they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. That's what they say at weddings. When God created marriage, he didn't create a wedding ceremony with the white dress and the vows and the speeches and the dancing, which we all love. And for those of us that were there at the wedding yesterday, it was great fun, and we love that. That was created by us. We created the wedding. We created the celebration to mark the moment when two people chose to commit to each other fully, chose to join together in a binding commitment. Sex was that covenantal act that actually meant that two people were married. Therefore, sex in some ways is marriage. Sex is the bonding together of two people a binding commitment. Therefore, sex inside of marriage is so important. And I can't emphasize this enough. People always say that sex is to be enjoyed inside a marriage, which it is. But in actual fact, sex is necessary inside of a marriage. A marriage without sex is often deeply unhappy, unconnected, and sadly often about to end. Why? Because sex is powerful. It connects two people together in such a profound and powerful and godly way. Proverbs 5, 18 to 19 says this. May your fountain be blessed, and may you rejoice in the wife of your youth. A loving doe, a graceful deer, uh, may her breasts satisfy you always, and may you ever be intoxicated with her love. So if you're married, I want to bring a quick challenge. When was the last time you had sex? I'm not saying that you have to have it every day. But it does need to be part of your regular rhythm of married life. If you are struggling to fit it in, maybe work is too busy or the kids are not sleeping, then I suggest scheduling it in. It might not sound romantic, but sex within a marriage is not an option, it's a necessity. 
We all think that spontaneous sex is the most romantic kind of sex. That's what movies and TV programs all tell us, that that spontaneous passion is like, whoa, that's the best sex ever. But if you don't have regular scheduled sex in your marriage, then there's no space or permission to have that spontaneous sex. A friend of mine calls it maintenance sex. It keeps you going, keeps you connected, and creates that space for, con connect, uh, for spontaneity. 1 Corinthians 7.5 says this, Do not deprive each other of sexual relations unless you both agree to refrain from sexual intimacy for a limited time, so you can give yourselves over more completely to prayer. Afterwards, you should come together again so that the Satan won't be able to tempt you because of your lack of self-control. Limited time for prayer and then come back together again. This is highlighting to us that we need to make sure in our marriages that we are having sex, that we are regularly scheduling sex because it's the glue that keeps us together. So sex is good. It's been designed by God, uh, not just for procreation, but for pleasure, for enjoyment, and for connection. Sex is necessary within a marriage and is in fact the covenantal act that confirms a the covenant of marriage. And sex is powerful, and so God created a container for it to contain the power in order so that it brought life and not chaos and destruction. My second point is this. Sadly, sex has been perverted. The enemy has come in and removed it from God's intended purpose. You see, the enemy has come into the world and he's whispering his lies, telling us that sex is just a physical act. And he's telling us that we all have urges and we should therefore just go and fulfill our urges with whoever, however we need to, at whatever point. We've become a culture that thinks marriage is just a piece of paper and sex is just something that you do or you perform with someone else. It has no longer become about two people being united together in a binding commitment, bonding together physically, emotionally, and spiritually. What has happened is we've tried to remove the spiritual and often even the emotional from, the side sex, from sex. It is all about experiencing pleasure immediately. And if they didn't perform well, if they didn't perform like the TV shows and the movies and pornography shows us, then maybe just go off and find someone who might perform better. Current culture places me and my needs as the priority not about mutual, reciprocal sex. It's not about learning and growing together in sex, but about immediate performance. I don't know if you've noticed this, but shows and TV programs and books, and every time I read a chick flick novel, which I do enjoy, it shows you a relationship that starts with this incredible, passionate sex that's like fireworks, and it's like the sex they've never, ever had. And that's the moment they realize that this person is the one because of the sex, not because of the person, because of the sex. And actually, as you go through watching that relationship evolve in your TV program or whatever, you generally see that sex actually kind of whittles out. That as they have kids or don't have kids, as their lives get busy, sex becomes a non, a non thing. But I want to tell you that within a marriage, sex is not based upon a performance. It's not about performing to one another, but uniting together. It's about a connection. And it does get better. It does obviously have its ups and downs like most things in life. But if you commit to your marriage and therefore commit to sex, then it does get better. You see, there is an enemy at work in our world. And that enemy, some people call the devil, some people call Satan, but he is desperate to do all he can to take your eyes off of Jesus. He wants you to think he is more powerful than he actually is. And his aim is to get you to think about something other than Jesus because he knows that when you do, your lives will begin to wobble. And one of the ways he does that is through sex. He tries to take our eyes off Jesus and onto sex. He tries to take our eyes off Jesus and onto immediate pleasure. He tries to take our eyes off Jesus and tries to whisper to us that it's my, it's my long-term boyfriend, it must be fine. And God is saying, have sex within the context of marriage. You see, the enemy wants us to believe that it's just physical. But sex was never designed to be just a physical act. It was not designed to be enjoined, enjoyed on a whim 
or as a casual experience. 1 Corinthians 6, 16 says, Do you not know that he who unites himself with a prostitute is one with her body? For it is said the two will become one flesh. Sex was designed in a way to have profound implications on our lives. It was designed in a way to cause really strong emotional connections and spiritual connections to whoever we're having sex with. It was designed in a way to confirm a covenant relationship. And so if sex is effectively married, the marriage act, then when we go around having sex with other people, we are actually tying ourselves in a covenant relationship to them. So are we really willing to marry the people we are having sex with? If the answer is yes, why not get married? In some ways, you already are. And we have seen over the last few years with COVID that you can get married really quickly and have a celebration later, right? Anyone been to any of those weddings? I've been to quite a few. Uh, And so if that's the case, if you want to get married to this person and you're having sex with them, why not get married and then plan a celebration for next year? That's fine. Um, But if the answer is no, if you're having sex with someone and you don't want to marry them, then please can I encourage you to stop connecting yourself in covenant relationships with various people. You see, God doesn't want you to not have sex because he's a killjoy. He doesn't want you to have sex outside of marriage because it kills joy. Sex in our culture is seen as a way to gain value, a way to gain confidence, a way to fill the emptiness and the loneliness. And yes, maybe for a few moments after sex, you might feel that way. But that sex wasn't designed to do that. Sex wasn't designed to give you value. Sex wasn't designed to give you confidence. It wasn't designed to fill the emptiness. Jesus is the only one who can do that. And so what we often find with casual sex is the immediate experience might be what you're looking for. But after a while, once it's over, it starts to actually highlight the way you are feeling anyway. I recently read a journal article all about hookups and hookup culture, and they weighed the pros and cons of this sex with, what was it, no strings attached sex. And they wanted to really show pros and cons. And it was interesting because the article really seemed, the whole way through the article, it seemed so desperate to have a balanced view. Like, I've, I've not read an article like that before. Usually they pick a side. But this side, this article really wanted to be like, here are all the pros to no, no, no strings attached sex, and here are the cons to no strings attached sex. And the final paragraph said this. By definition, sexual hookups provide the allure of sex without strings attached. But despite their increasing social acceptability, however, developing research suggests that sexual hookups may leave more strings attached than many participants might first assume. In some ways, even culture is realizing that there are strings attached to sex. We cannot have no strings attached sex. And so there are two other topics I want to cover in this second section, and that is pornography and masturbation. Pornography comes from the Greek word pornographos, which is made up of two Greek words, porneia, which is a prostitute or sex act or um, something like that and graphene, which means writings. And so basically, pornography means any description of books, movies, picture that shows a sex act or a naked person with the intent to be arousing. Pornography doesn't technically appear in the English Bible. But porne, the word, the Greek root word, appears 54 times in the New Testament. Generally translated as whore, harlot, prostitute, or promiscuous. You see, the problem with pornography is that we've now got what culture calls the triple A factor. Pornography has become accessible, it's become affordable, and you can do it anonymously. Why? Because it's moved from those seedy corner shop stands and adult video stores to our own homes, our own offices, and our mobile devices. The prevalence of pornography is hugely on the rise. Did you know that one in five mobile searches is for pornographic material? And the number one porn term breaks my heart because it's teen. That's the number one searched for porn term. Around 60% of children will watch porn for the first time between the ages of 11 and 13, with some even experiencing it as young as seven and eight, which breaks my heart because that's how old our daughter is. I can't imagine that experience. 
This is really the first time a generation is growing up, being raised or marinating their brain on porn, which is generally violent images of sex. That's what porn generally is. And this has a hugely formational impact on the individual because porn rewires our brains. Why? Because it's addictive. Porn causes the individual no longer to connect to the, a human, but instead to a computer screen. You see, when the computer helps you to release those chemicals and therefore experience those feelings like we talked about at the beginning, your brain starts to make those connections. And the more you do something to get that feeling, the more likely your brain is going to remember how you did it. It's like when we learn that water quenches first. The first time we might drink water to quench first. The second time we do it again. And every time we do that, it grows a pathway in our brain that tells us that water quenches thirst. And now, I'm sure as adults, all of us probably know if we're thirsty, we need water, right? It's the same. As we go about watching pornography to satisfy the need, our brain decides that it is the answer to the need. Due to the high release of chemicals when watching pornography, it takes less repetition to create that pathway than it would for other things that we want, maybe even want to put in our brains. You know, like choosing to get up and read your Bible in the morning. I would love to make that a really easy thing in my brain, but I can't. It's harder. But watching pornography releases so many chemicals into your brains that it's, it makes that pathway so, quick, so quickly. And these pathways retrain the brain into thinking that porn is the only solution to that need. And therefore, sex with a person no longer meets that need. The other problem with it is that eventually the brain cannot cope with the amount of dopamine being released into your brains. And so what it does is every time you watch pornography, at least it releases less dopamine. And in some ways, it also reduces your receptiveness to dopamine. And so in order to get that fix, you've got to go for more harder pornography, you've got to go for more extreme sex, you've more varied things, more novel things that you would never have chosen to watch in the first place. Why? Because your brain is making you do that. Because you've tra retrained your brain. And the reason for that is that as your, as your um, dopamine receptors get lessened and you release less dopamine, it's called desensitization. And what happens there is that it results in the prefrontal cortex of your brain being affected and it causes changes to take place in your prefrontal lobes. And sadly, that is the place in your brain that is responsible for your willpower and for your decision making. So it's altering your brain and allowing you to not have so much willpower or decision making. And that's what porn is doing to our bodies. Porn is not just an addiction, though. It also removes mutuality from the relationship. Pornography dis demonstrates relationships based on objectifying and conquering, not communicating and caring. 88% of scenes within, a por within pornography contain some form of aggression. And yet, as Christians, as followers of Jesus, we're commanded to, to love our neighbor. Is objectifying and conquering love? No. And Matthew 7, 12 says, in everything do to others as you would have do to them. And therefore, in that sense, sinful sex is any sexual activity which you would not want reciprocated. Rachel Gardner, who is a youth worker and a church pastor, and she speaks a lot on this, this issue, she says, we have been created for God-honoring love, for relationships marked by covenant faithfulness and selflessness. And yet porn eclipses all of that and only leads to brokenness, sadness, emptiness, and hopelessness. And porn also changes the way we see ourselves and the way we see others. And yet God created us in his image. He created us and he said, you are fearfully and wonderfully made. And yet the problem with porn, one of the problems with pornography is that it changes the way we view ourselves and the way we view others. Thatcher also said in her book, pornography distorts the way that women, the men view women as it encourages the view that women are sex objects whose function is to be available for male gratification. I think with the rise in pornography going the other way and women watching pornography too, I think it could easily be said for the other way too. 
sadly many women and men have reported to being pressured into types of sex that are painful and comfortable to withstand violence, to fake pleasure in order to act like what someone else has seen in pornography. And it distorts our view of ourselves because pornography tends to use certain types of women and men and therefore a dissatisfaction with ourselves can grow. It's been really interesting as we've seen the rise in pornography over the last however many years, we've also seen a trend in something called labiaplasticies. This can also be known as the designer vagina uh, and is a surgery that takes place on the female genitalia. And stats have shown us that in 2016 there was a 45% rise from 2015 of this surgery taking place. Porn has an impact on how we see ourselves. And porn is as heavily associated with masturbation. And now masturbation is not in the Bible. There is a passage in the Old Testament that's actually about an Old Testament form of marriage. It's not about masturbation. And while the Bible doesn't talk about masturbation, the Bible can give us things that we can learn about to help us understand what God and God's opinion of masturbation is. In the Bible, there seems to be this reference to two types of sin, action sins and thought sins. And God says both are sins. Matthew 5, 28 says, but I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his, uh, his heart. So if masturbation is looking lustfully at someone who is not your spouse, then you, according to the Bible verse, you have already sinned. But maybe you're saying, well, what if I go away for work a lot and I masturbate looking at my wife, thinking about my wife or my husband? Well, I would want to ask you just one question about how that is bringing you closer together. How is that being a reciprocal moment of connection? If sex is meant to be about two people coming together in a way, serving one another, pleasuring one another, then masturbation alone is more about serving my need, fulfilling my desire, me experiencing pleasure, and is therefore a selfish act, not a selfless one. Another question I've heard multiple times is, what about watching pornography with my spouse as a way of arousing ourselves? Well, I would say, firstly, this has a huge impact on your marriage. By doing so, you are adding other people into the equation of your marriage. You're also sadly saying to your spouse that they're not attractive enough to get you aroused. And pornography is so addictive, it can go down such a detrimental path. And secondly, because the people within pornography are having their bodies violated in order for you to experience pleasure. Do to others as you would have done to you. So I would say no. 1 Corinthians 6.18 says, Flee from sexual immorality. All other sins a person commits are outside of the body, but whoever sins sexually sins against their own body. In context, Paul is writing to a community where the, in the culture it was really common to go to the temple of Aphrodite and to masturbate while, whilst watching the religious sex acts. That's, that's what was happening. And Paul is therefore challenging them, and he's saying, flee. Like, run away, leave. Don't stand on the edge and dip your toe in to see what it feels like. He's saying, turn and go. Run. You might not be like me. You might love a scary movie, but I hate a scary movie. I'm sure I've told many of you this before, but I cannot stand them. And the ones I watched as teenagers, I still have very vivid memories of, and I wish I never watched them. But I remember from watching those very few scary movies, there's that moment in every scary movie where the young girl is living in her house happily at nighttime with no parents on Halloween, and, uh, and she's just there. And then suddenly there's a knock at the door. And as the viewer, we all know what's outside that door. Some sort of killery, monstery thing, whatever it is. And we all watch as this girl tiptoes across the room, down the hallway to open the door. And if you're like me, you're probably sat there going, don't do it. Don't open that door. You don't want to do that. It's going to kill you. And as we step towards sexual immorality, I believe that heaven is screaming down, don't do it. Don't do it. Don't, don't open that door. Don't let the enemy get a foothold in your life in this way. I'm calling you to purity. That is what I'm calling you to. And so I believe when we're unsure about anything, we should ask this question. By doing this, am I becoming more like Jesus? And if the answer is no, then we should do what Paul says. We should turn and flee. 
So sex is good. It is good. I know we've just spent a few moments talking about the not so good things about it, but sex is good. It's been designed by God for procreation, for pleasure, for connection. It's necessary within a marriage and confirms the covenant of marriage. Sex is powerful and therefore was designed to be contained within marriage. But sex has been perverted by the enemy. Culture has believed the lies that sex is just a physical act and that we are living in a culture where it's all about me, my pleasure, my enjoyment and getting my satisfaction wherever I need, whenever I want. And so my final point is this. Although sex has power and although sex, the power of sex can have profound implications on our lives, God is more powerful than sex. You can experience transformation. And so when I was praying about this message, I believe that there were sort of three types of people, three groups of people in this room. There might be more of you, uh, but three different groups that I wanted to speak to today. And the first group are those of you who grew up like me, who grew up believing that sex was dirty, was wrong, was evil. Maybe you became a purity pusher as well, like me, and wore the ring and did all you could to make sure all your friends knew that you were never, ever going to have sex. And uh, maybe today you need God to come in and break that view off you because sex is good and he designed it, not the enemy. And so maybe you need to God to transform your view of sex into the one that is one that he created as an incredible connection point between two people. And he created purposefully. The second group are those of you who may have experienced sex outside of marriage, maybe just once in your past or maybe multiple times. Maybe you're even stuck into a pattern or addicted to watching pornography. And you need God to come in and break the hold that sex has on your life, bring you back to a place of purity, back into alignment with him and what he says about sex. And the final group are those of you who have sadly experienced sex unwillingly, where it was experienced without your consent, and therefore, understandably to you, sex does not seem like something that is enjoyable or pleasurable, but instead a violent act. And God can take any situation, and he can turn it around, and he can bring healing and wholeness. So maybe you need God to come into your life today to bring you into that place of healing. Maybe you need to bring him to bring you back to a place of seeing sex as a mutual, loving act, the way God designed it to be. But let me encourage you to reach out, ask for prayer, get some support, talk to a friend, talk to me, talk to a doctor, talk to a therapist. Get the support that you need to process what you have been through. God can bring about transformation in your life. God can transform you to a place of a healthy place. When we read the genealogy of Jesus in the gospel, which is the history of Jesus' ancestors, we see, like in most genealogies, a long list of men. Any other women feel a bit offended that we go through all the effort of having pregnancy and giving birth and we're not mentioned? But in the genealogy of Jesus, there are four women mentioned. And these four women become part of the lineage of Jesus. They become part of the, the grace from, of God that's saying, I'm bringing someone to save you. And the amazing thing about these four women is they all acted scandalously at one point in their life. Rahab was a prostitute, and then she got married and joined the lineage of Jesus. Tamar tricks her father-in-law into having sex with her in order to conceive and she joins the lineage of Jesus. Ruth lies at the feet of her guardian redeemer to encourage him to redeem her. And she joins the lineage of Jesus. And Bathsheba, while well, she was originally a wife of Uriah, she commits adultery with King David. And she joins the lineage of Jesus. The fact that these women have made it to the lineage of Jesus is a profound demonstration of the grace and transformation of God at work. We have all messed up. We have all sinned. We have all fallen short from the glory of God. But God sent Jesus to wipe our slates clean, to bring us back into relationship with him, to bring us back to a place of righteousness. Levi Lusco says this, you don't have to get good to go to God. 
you go to God in order to get good. Whatever you experience, your experience of sex has been, when you encounter the cross of Jesus, our lives can be transformed. The Bible tells us that we should do two things. We should repent and we should believe. Believing, we need to believe in the good news of Jesus dying on the cross for us in order to pay the, the punishment of our sins. We need to believe that our sleep, slate is wiped clean. And we need to believe we've been brought back into relationship with him. And we need to repent. There is always an action associated with repentance. It, true repentance causes us to turn 180 away from our sin towards Jesus. And true repentance causes us to do things differently, not continuing in our sinful behavior. 1 John 1, 9 says, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. I believe that this morning many of us may need to repent. We might need to repent of the actions that we've done. We might need to repent of our thoughts. And we might need to come back into alignment with what God says about sex. And we also need to believe. We need to choose to believe that we are not damaged goods. We need to believe that God brings us back to that place of purity. We need to believe that he created sex and he created it for pleasure, for procreation and for connection. We need to believe that he can bring the healing that we need. And we need to believe that he is a God and he can do and has done all of those things. Why? Because he loves us. We are his children. He loves you. And no matter what you've done, haven't done, seen, haven't seen, thought or haven't thought, he still loves you. And he longs to bring you into a deeper relationship with him. He longs to bring you to a place of righteousness, to make you right again through the death of Jesus. And he can do all this this morning. All we have to do is confess. He is faithful to forgive and purify us. And we need to believe that he has done it and we are standing in righteousness. So can I invite everyone to just stand up and can I invite the team to join me? And I just want to take a few moments to pray. But before I do, I want to remind you that there are things, lots of things that I haven't talked about today. And there's lots of things that I've probably half touched on, but not. So do come and speak to myself, Johnny. Speak to a friend, get some prayer. We would, we would love to do that with you. We would love to stand with you in prayer. And so first, I actually just want to pray for everyone in this room and everyone watching online. Father God, I thank you that you created sex. I thank you that you designed it in such an in intricate and, and purposeful way, a way of uniting two people together. I thank you that you created it. I pray for those who are like me, have got into the mindset of thinking it is wrong or evil or bad. God, I pray that you would break that off them right now. I pray that you would bring, bring them to a place of seeing that it's something that you designed as a godly thing. I pray for those who may have explored sexually before marriage and I pray that you would come and speak to them and bring them to a place of purity, bring them back into restoration with you. I pray for those who are hurting because of the experiences of sex they've had in the past, God. I pray that you would come, you would wrap them up, bring them healing that they need, God. Bring them to a place of seeing sex again as what you made it to be, mutual, loving, God, we just pray for everyone in this room, God, right now, and everyone watching online. I just pray that you would break off any shame that has crept in this morning, God. I pray against that in Jesus' name.